grateful again for this opportunity to be together and to worship and pray that we'll have some things from our study at this time that will be helpful uh, to us as we try to unpack some of the concepts that we've been looking in the book of Colossians. And as you study the book of Colossians, as you start going through it, it's kind of interesting to me that there are three words that we often see quite a bit throughout other passages of Scripture that we always see grouped together. Very rarely do we find these words individually without being associated with the others, and that is faith, hope, and love. And the book of Colossians opens up uh, with the premise that everything Paul is going to help this congregation be rooted and grounded in is based on understanding how these three words all kind of work together. They work together in helping us understand practically how the gospel works for us. Um, and perhaps maybe the, the most famous, most maybe maybe well remembered uh, occasion of it is in First Corinthians. Uh, probably maybe the most uh, quoted, uh, but you see them grouped together um, as Paul was going to uh, delve into the concept of love and really could not do so without also adding to it the concept of faith and hope. And we just want to look at that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, beginning in verse 8. Paul says, Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child... I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. But now faith, hope, and love. Abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. I find it interesting that even as Paul was going to hone in specifically on love and expand on that, he really couldn't uh, describe it without grouping it together with faith and hope. And what we really find is the Colossian letter opens up. Because remember, Paul's point in writing this is helping us realize everything that we benefit spiritually is because of what Christ has done for us. Uh, other passages talk about just how it's kind of complicated when you just even start talking about God. There's so many concepts, it's kind of hard to kind of group it all together and consistently in, in organized thought. Faith, hope, and love is kind of, we talk about maybe the manifold grace of God, the very color, very, uh, the varied aspects of all the complicated nature of who God is. Faith, hope, and love help us kind of organize our thoughts in a consistent manner, helping us see how the kind of complicated way Christ works for us, but we can see it defined in three specific ways. So hopefully as we look at that, this we want to look at beginning in the book of Colossians, but also as we look at how other passages expound on these concepts, really brings to us a very beautiful, complete image of, of what exactly Christ is doing for us through the gospel. Uh, so let's just look at that uh, in Colossians. Uh, turn over to Colossians chapter 1. And I want to see how it unfolds right out, out of the gate, so to speak, the minute you start uh, turning to this section and reading. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Now, as we read verses 3 through 5, notice how these three words, faith, hope, and love, begin to unfold as he writes this letter. In verse 3, he says, We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world, also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing 
even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. And so we just want to simply um, kind of uh, word by word, just kind of starting with faith, because that seems to be the, the foundational aspect of how all these other words work together and kind of work off of each other. Uh, everything stems from faith. Uh, faith is one of the most beautiful aspects, really, of the gospel. Again, we've spent quite a bit of time showing how uh, Paul is emphasizing that uh, we need to understand that um, the bulk of how the gospel works for us is based off of faith, not by works of our own righteousness. In other words, nothing that we do can earn or twist God's mind or, or win back His favor. It is all going to be uh, focused on a confidence in what Christ was able to accomplish. That's what we talked about this morning. Going back to all the wonderful things that only Jesus was able to do. Only He was strong enough, capable enough, and able to bring us back to God. It was all based on what He accomplished for us in His death, burial, and resurrection. Now on that confidence is this, the bedrock of our faith in how God looks at us. How we can have a confident way to boldly come to God and look at how He sees us because of our response to the gospel. That's our faith. In fact, Paul expounds on this in uh, a couple of verses. Go on uh, uh, down a few verses in the first chapter and read in verse 21. Now, verse 21 kind of picks up on where we, where we began this morning. We looked at verses uh, 13 and 14. What Jesus accomplished and how He did it. Verse 13 says, For He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Our faith is a confident way of now realizing God approves of us. Not because somehow we have now totally uh, changed our ways and how now because we've changed, now suddenly all, all of a sudden uh, God has forgotten everything we've done in the past. But that is because of the blood. That is because of the sacrifice. It is because of our faith and our obedience to the gospel, our death to the, that previous way of life, our confidence that we have been totally changed become new creatures in God's sight. Our faith and how God sees us is now rooted in this concept that we trust completely in what God did through His Son that allows us to have peace, that allows us to be confident, allows us to rest at ease, to have uh, an innocent conscience before God. And notice how Paul explains that in verse 21. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, he says, And, and although... Although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind. Why were you hostile in mind? Why were you alienated? Why were you separated from God? Because of the things that we did. Because of the sins we were committing. That uh, per, per, uh, made it impossible for us to have a peaceful conscience in how we uh, looked at God's stand, or how we looked at our standing before God. We could not have peace because we were guilty. He says, but because we were engaged in evil deeds. Yet, verse 22, what does our faith teach us? Our faith teaches us that because we have now repented because of those evil deeds, we have now committed ourselves to trusting in God, leading us in His ways, and because of the cleansing, the washing of His blood, we now have a confident way to see ourselves before God. In verse 22, he says, Yet He has now reconciled you, how? In His fleshly body, through death, in order to present you before Him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If, indeed, you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. So here's the foundational kind of starting point of how we can see ourselves. It's based off of this faith the concept that going all the way back to the days of Abraham, that Paul extensively argues throughout Romans and Galatians and even uh, in Ephesians, that Abraham, the father of faith, was approved to God because he trusted in his system of obedience. Not obedience of, of perfect works of righteousness, but trusting in God's system, trusting in the things that God said would happen if he would trust and follow his direction, follow his guidance. 
despite the fact that we have fallen horribly into sin because of this flesh, because of the uh, desires that the flesh uh, makes so strong in us, and Satan manipulates and, and deceives us into following after those ways, now through the gospel, we have confidence that despite we formerly were living that way, now we can rest at ease. We can kind of go to sleep with a peaceful conscience. If we are Christians, if we've been baptized, we can have confidence through faith that we are approved to God. Turn over to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10. Expound to this. And again, notice we're going to look at faith. But again, the Hebrew writer can't talk about faith without talking about hope and love. And we're going to end on this passage after we kind of run through various other scriptures. I'm going to end on this section. So we're going to come back here. But just for the time being, look at how he breaks down faith. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. In verse 19, he says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, how? By the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus, you have confidence. That's faith. Trust that He lived righteously. Trust that He was able to victoriously overcome every temptation, as we talked about this morning. How He almost was kind of the underdog in doing that because He put on the very fleshly uh, components that we have as human beings that makes it so difficult for us spiritually to be pleasing to God. It is because of our flesh. And yet Jesus, in His flesh, was victorious and He used that flesh as a sacrifice and shed that blood that He might atone for all the sins that we have committed in this body. And so now He says because of that, there is a faith that's the, the bedrock again uh, of, of how we see ourselves and how God sees us. We are approved and we must have confidence in this approval. Confidence because of what we have been able to have access to through the gospel by having access to the blood. He says in verse 20, by a new and living way which He inaugurated for us through the veil that is His flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. In other words, don't let the bothered conscience that we have recognizing that we feel the tremendous amount of guilt for the things that we have done. And he says the confidence that we have is faith in the blood that was shed from one who lived in the flesh perfectly. Now we have been cleansed and now we're going to talk about how hope and faith are going to work together to causing this change in how we live in this body. And we have to start with faith. And the best illustration uh, that I personally have heard anybody describing what he's saying here, I maybe have used it before, but, but really it's, it's the best one that I, I, I think just so is so fitting to what he's describing. Uh, I, I heard someone give an illustration of uh, the, the benefits you get when you're going to an amusement park uh, where maybe there's a little, very long line you have to wait for to get on the ride if you're choosing. And they have uh, something that's called fast pass or easy access or something you can pay to have kind of a wristband that allows you to kind of avoid the waiting, avoid the line, you can get right up to the front. And what he's saying is we now have this fast pass VIP access to God Envision you kind of have this red wristband, and that's the blood of Christ. You have been given privileged access to the blood of Christ that allows us to boldly, confidently go right to the front of the room. That we have access to go to God and appear before Him. Yes, even when we have committed sin, we have the ability to have access to the blood that He is able to mediate for us. And as we confess, as we acknowledge, He is willing what to cleanse us of our sins. Why? Because we have access to the blood. When you have access to the blood, you have immediate access to the most intimate places of God, even in the most holy place. That is our faith. That is our confidence. Now, I want to go over to a passage in Romans chapter 7 that talks about how hope kind of works alongside with this. Because while we have confidence, we also recognize we have a big problem. We talked about that problem a little bit this morning. The problem is that even while we have faith that we are saved by the blood of, of Jesus, saved by what He accomplished, we have to be very honest with ourselves and reconciled with the fact that we often, 
whether we would like to admit it, are not walking in a way that pleases God. If we recognize that He demands perfection, that He demands perfection in every possible way, that is the only way Jesus could approve, to be pleasing to God, to be adequate, adequate sacrifices, He had to be perfect. And we recognize we have been challenged to now walk in His ways. We talked about that passage in Colossians. It says we must walk pleasing in Him in every aspect. Totally pleasing to Him. Well, that, that weighs heavy on our minds because we have to ask ourselves, how can I have faith even when I struggle in the flesh? This is why hope is so important. When we talk about hope, we are talking about a deliverance from the very thing that causes us to stumble. We have been saved not just to depart from the way of life of, of sin and, and this mortal body, but also to one day totally be changed when we no longer have this body. Paul went into great detail in the Corinthian letter. We kind of went to the end of 1 Corinthians about how we are going to have hope that one day we're going to be changed. And with that, there is a great hope that we will finally be relieved of the burden of the thing that conflicts with our, our, our very nature. We, we, we've come to God because we realize we don't want to sin. We realize what sin has done. Sin has separated us from God. Sin has alienated from Him. Sin has brought destruction and brought every evil thing in our life. And we are wanting to escape it. That's, why we, that's what the gospel is so appealing. It's a way to cleanse us, to free us, to allow us to have a clear, pure conscience. But that we wrestle with that very concept when we realize that we still stumble, we struggle. And the flesh makes it so hard for us to consistently walk in His ways. We're striving to do better every, every day. But in the meantime, while we're struggling, while we're, while we're wrestling with it, how do, we, how do we continue to maintain faith? Hope helps us. Notice how Paul brings this idea of hope in the conversation in Romans chapter 7 in a very personal, revealing description of his own stumblings, of his own conflicts. Listen to what he says in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 14. And verse 14 says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am a flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do. But I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Enemy. Do we catch this, this inner conflict, like this civil war within our very... Is this what he describes? Is this a war waging? In other words, he is, he's speaking of someone who has faith. That's what he's speaking of. He's speaking of the concept. He says, I have faith that the gospel has cleansed me, that the gospel has released me, the gospel has given me new life. But I'm also very honest to realize I have a lot of work to do. <laughs> there are so many times when I wish I could do what God wants me to do and my flesh gets in the way. And so he's wrestling with this and it's bothering him and it's weighing on his mind. So he's coming, I, faith alone isn't enough. There's something in addition to faith that we also have to lie. He's going to get to that. Notice what he gets to. So he's honest about this conflict. So how does he resolve it? Verse 21, he says, I find then the principle that evil is present in me. The one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in my members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am. So in other words, even with faith we struggle. Faith is not enough. Faith alone. Because we recognize that while I have to trust in the blood of Jesus and trust in the gospel, I'm still confronted with my failures. How, in the, how, do I, how do I overcome this? Paul answers it. How do, I, how do I get through this? Who will set me free from the body of this death 
Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. What Paul is saying is I have hope that even with this constant battle and struggle, there will one day be a day where I no longer have to wear this flesh. I don't know if we really think about that as often as we should because to think in that means almost a welcoming of the inevitable. The scriptures say, blessed are those who die in the Lord. It's not something we're, into, we're, we're wanting, of course, to happen. We're not, we're not, uh, we're just wanting to say, well, uh, let, let me just count down the days. I can't wait till the day of my death. No, that's not what it's saying. But it is telling us that as a Christian, while we, that's the concept we wrestle with. We want to do the things that, that please God, but we also recognize that our flesh is just riddled with temptation and, 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 and devices that Satan takes advantage of, and it constantly messes with our concept of feeling at peace with God. So there's hope. Hope that one day we will be relieved from this burden. And so in other words, we live with joy. We live every day. We live the best we possibly can every day with that anticipation of hope. Notice how that is going to be revealed in several other passages. No, no 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This concept is brought up in this section. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in verse 1. Listen to the language of Paul here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 1 says, For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. In other words, through the gospel, the gospel is our escape from the burden of our conscience, the burden of feeling guilty, the burden of feeling alienated and separated from a pure God, yet we cannot escape this flesh. It is going to be a constant burden all the days of our life. We have hope, though. Hope is the anticipation that one day we finally will be changed and this flesh will no longer be an issue. Notice how he builds on this. Verse 6, Therefore being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith. The best commentary on that very scripture what we just read in Romans chapter 7, that's what he's saying. I walk by faith. In other words, I recognize this body of flesh is going to produce problems, but I have to have confident faith that despite this fact, I still have access to the blood, but I still at times have a guilty conscience. So it is hope that takes us to the next level. He says in verse 8, We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, notice, to be pleasing to Him. Here is our motivation to develop the proper spirit and the proper conditions of our walk in this world that disciplines this flesh. Because if we recognize there is a great hope that lets us realize one day this flesh will no longer be a problem. And the reason we love that, the reason we hope in that, is because we love God with all of our being, all of our, 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 our soul and our heart and our mind, so much that we would not want nothing more than to, when we appear before God, to have that sense of being appeased in His eyes, to, to be pleasing in His sight. But we also realize that we, that day will not come until after our death. So while we are in the flesh, we are motivated to strive to please Him as best as we possibly can. Notice what he says in verse 9, Therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may be recompensed for His deeds in the body, according to what He has done, whether good or bad. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and note how Paul is going to continue to expound this concept of how hope motivates us. 
to what we realize. That's how we reconcile this. That God actually put desired to put within us a hope that trusts in this very fact that He recognizes while we struggle in the flesh, that one day it's His anticipation, His great desire for us to not even have this flesh. That doesn't happen until we reach the end of our journey. But in the meantime, we have this. We have hope in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. That kind of works along with our faith. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 8. It says, But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet... The hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. So that's why we have a sympathetic high priest who recognizes all the challenges that we have with the flesh. It is also His great desire that one day we never be burdened by he recognizes because he lived in the flesh, he knows all too well how much of a challenge this is for us. And so the great hope we have is the only way I will ever finally, eternally be totally done with sin is when I no longer have this flesh that makes the conflict so intense. And again, that's, that has to be built on first the foundation point of I trust in the blood. I trust in what God has done. And I recognize I'm motivated by His love. And that's the third point. How, do, how does this all work together? It is love that teaches and motivates us to strive to be pleasing to Him, that equips us to be pleasing to Him. It is only through learning about His love that puts within us the proper uh, ability and, 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 and motivation to truly walk before Him. Again, it's motivated on the concept that I hope in one day I no longer have to deal with this flesh. But until, the me, but until that day comes, I have a great desire to be pleasing to Him even now in this flesh. And the only hope I have is unless I walk in love. Before, I just want to read a couple other passages that lead up to this. Turn over to 1 John uh, chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And I want to start reading verse 28. 1 John chapter 2. And verse 28. Notice what he says about hope. Now, little children... Abide in Him, so that when He appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from Him in shame at His coming. If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of Him. That is ultimately really the best we can, we can hope for in this life, to practice righteousness. We will get better and better at it as long as we mature. We will, yes, be able to sin less and less. But the reality is, as long as we are in this flesh, we have a major, major conflict. Every mature Christian will always have this conflict. It never goes away. And therefore, there's always, always that sense that one day, as we're walking, trying to please Him, just as Paul says, I will feel that wretchedness of flesh. <laughs> Why? I have a desire. I don't want to do this. I would give everything to say I didn't do it. The reality is, I did. So hope allows us to ascend to that state of mind that says God Himself has a great desire to relieve us of this burden and one day we will no longer have it. So in this hope, let us also strive to please Him realizing that He sympathizes with this struggle and therefore He loves us and is going to equip us with love so that we can manage it as best as we possibly can. And that's where we, we read uh, one other passage in terms of hope, and we'll move on to love. But read First Peter chapter 1. Uh, Peter uh, sums this up quite well. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 13 says, uh, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Remember, how do I have hope? First, I have to have faith. Faith that I can confidently come before God based on what Jesus did, based on what His blood allows me uh, to be cleansed of. Now I have this hope, and I fix that hope completely on what? On the revelation of Jesus. Because what's going to happen when He is revealed, when I see Him? He's going to change me. 
But in the meantime, until that day comes, what does Peter say? Verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. In other words, the very reason why Jesus wants to rid us of this flesh is because he wants nothing more than for us to share a relationship that is free from the burdens of sin. So let that, that, that be a motivation for us to want to be pleasing to him in all respects, especially now. And so he motivates us, how? Through love. Through love. And it's going to bring this all together. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 kind of brings all this together. Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 says, Therefore you have been raised up with Christ. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ is who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them, but now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free men, but Christ is all in it all. When we get to verses 12 through 17, this is the practical application of how love works. Love is the dedication to realizing that God wants nothing more than for all of us to be totally free from all imperfection and all sin. That's why He shed His blood for us. To at least allow us the ability to experience that on the basis of faith. And we also have this hope that while we're struggling in this flesh, it is His great desire to alleviate this burden and for us to be at, totally at, complete in Him in the heavenly existence in the spiritual body. But until that time, we must strive to please Him even in this fleshly body. And He says, practice righteousness. How do I practice righteousness? I practice love. Going back to some of the things we talked about and how the new, new covenant is so much different from the old. It's motivated by this concept of as I learn love, I'm essentially equipping myself to learn righteousness. So here's what He says in verse 12. So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. Remember just as we talked about this morning, kind of brings that concept to completion. What we talked about this morning, the idea that Christ needs to be in us. That gives us the ability to adequately practice righteousness. We have the motivation of hope, which is one day we will no longer have this internal struggle. As long as our intention is to practice righteousness, it is not going to be easy. Hence the admonition, let the powerful one dwell in us. Let his power work in us. How? Going to the word. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you. Let prayer and songs and hymns and spiritual teaching dwell in us. Let us assemble to, with one another. Encourage one another. And I'm going to come back to Hebrews. Hebrews brings us all together in a very compact way. Go back to that passage in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. 
And note how all these three concepts are woven together. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by what? The blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. What does that faith mean? It means we can have our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. In other words, don't let the fact that when we stumble, and yes, that guilty conscience will work in us, don't forget that you have access to the blood. But yet we also realize that that still is not the greatest consolation because we have the reality that I'm still struggling. I'm still, I, I realize the goal here is to put away sin completely. So I have hope of looking at it through the, the eyes of the Lord who wants us to be rid of this. He understands how difficult this is. He's a sympathetic high priest, it says. So we have hope. Notice he transitions to that. So let's have full assurance of faith so our hearts can be sprinkled clean of an evil conscience. Notice verse 23. Now let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. He has promised that one day we will no longer have to be burdened with this. In the meantime, verse 25, or verse 24. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to what? To love. And what follows after love? Good deeds. Love is the practical way we learn to practice righteousness. So yes, we must motivate one another to please God in our behavior, in our existence in this flesh. But we also have a wonderful hope that one day we will no longer be burdened. And that's His plan. Part of the gospel plan is that we no longer have this flesh. We will be given a spiritual body. Why? Because we cannot please God perfectly in this present existence. So all these things work. It's, it's very adamant that we see these things working together. Starting with the concept that through the gospel you can have faith. Is there anyone here who needs to walk by faith and not by sight? If you have not yet had the confidence that you can come to God and confidently not allow your, your burdened conscience to get in the way, the only way you can do that is unless you have been baptized. If you have not been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, you do not have confidence. There should be no assurance that you can speak to God on a level where He is pleased with you. You must have access to the blood. And when you do so, you can have faith. That you no longer have to be burdened by the evil conscience of your deeds. And you can now build on that with a hope that re realize that one day God's intention is for you to be alleviated of that burden. And now we're motivated by His love. That we have the greatest desire to please Him. And we realize because of His patience, because of His mercy, we certainly owe that to Him. To do our very, very best to minimize the sins we commit. To discipline ourselves. And we do so by trusting that His love has the power to equip us and teach us to walk in a way that pleases Him. And why it's so important that we come together, that we encourage and motivate one another as we study as we sing praises, as we pray, because that's what we're doing. We're tapping into the powerful source that equips us to please Him. So He says there, let us uh, stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Verse 25, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Can we encourage you to obey the gospel if you've already done so and you're struggling maybe perhaps with sin or struggling with your faith or struggling with uh, the, the hope that you need, can we encourage you to put these, things, these three concepts together to give you a sure confidence that you can truly please God through the gospel. Whatever your case may be, we want to encourage you and help you to be more consistent in your walk with God and to begin that walk if you haven't even started. Once you come to the front, we'll assist and help you obey the gospel while we stand and sing this song of encouragement together.